So welcome to the third session of the chapter on dealing with anger. So this is our Sutta study class. And out of great compassion for myself, I chose this book so that I can simply work through it. And also compassion for all of us because it's very nicely themed. And so as many of you know, or some of you are here for the first time, uh, we've been working through it and we're now on the chapter three about dealing with anger. And uh, last week we called the session Vipers and Resentment because we talked about people who are like vipers, um, depending on whether their anger is quick to come up and lasts a long time or slow to come up and lasts a long time or quick to come up and doesn't last, slow to come up and doesn't last, which I'm sure is probably the most... Um, I don't want to say better, but it's probably the least painful of all four for ourselves and for others as well. Um, so, yeah, the Buddha defined sort of virulent venom as the one that lasts a long time. And we had some discussions around that. And we also had some discussions around resentment and how resentment occurs. Of course, resentment is a form of anger. It's almost like a consolidated form a little bit like the line drawn on the rock. I don't know if you remember in a previous session, we talked about types of anger, such as a line drawn on the water, I think it was, which obviously can't really stay at all. <laughs> you know, it's almost the minute you do it, the minute the water parts, it closes up again. Uh, a line drawn on the sand or a line drawn on the rock, chiseled into the rock with a hammer. And, uh, this is what happens when we have resentment. So last week we talked about that and it was really around unskillful ways of using thought. So actually dwelling on things that have happened, thinking that they acted for my harm, they are acting for my harm or they will act for my harm. And then the next uh, se uh, section on that was, um, they acted for the harm of one who is pleasing and agreeable to me, or they, are acting for the harm of one who's pleasing and agreeable, or they will act for the harm of one who is pleasing and agreeable. So we can see how this is like holding on to things that have happened, um, consolidating things that are happening by having thoughts about it that are fueling the anger, or uh, projecting into the future with a very negative mind and a mind that is uh, presuming and expecting the worst. And then the other one's quite interesting because it's um, we can harbor resentment by thinking that someone acted for the benefit of one who is disagreeable to me, right? We don't want our enemies to be happy. So even someone else who helps them, we harbor resentment towards them. Or they are acting for the benefit of one who is displeasing and disagreeable. Or they will act for the benefit of one who is displeasing and disagreeable to me. And you can imagine how that could be, perhaps you have a friend who used to be your friend, but is now maybe not sure whether they're your friend or not, but they befriend someone else and that someone else treats them really well and you feel like, oh, this is quite divisive. This is dividing them from me. They're not likely to uh, want to be my friend again. So it's kind of like forming little cliques and feeling that, you know, if two people are, or if one person is disagreeable, no one else should befriend them. And if they do, we can't be friends with them either. <laughs> and this is, you know, this is common, isn't it? You know, we, uh, we like common friends, but we don't like common enemies. And sometimes even when we have common friends, there's jealousies that arise or competition that arises. And then the last one of those 10 was that um, one becomes angry without a reason. So, to me, that sort of uh, could suggest that somebody's just suppressed so much anger and allowed it to build up to such a degree that it just comes out at the most inopportune times, almost without a trigger or with a very small trigger that you would think there's no need to be angry over such a small thing. But this can be what happens when resentment becomes embedded and ingrained in the heart. So I think it's also a lack of forgiveness, isn't it? That also allows resentment to be uh, to become solidified in the heart. Hmm. So having done that brief summary, 
it would be nice to get on to the next uh, paragraph. And this is on page 53. Um, I can see that someone didn't know the sutta, the book. Um, you might want to purchase a copy, but don't worry if you don't have one to hand, because I will be reading out everything um, that the Buddha says, and then um, also inviting some discussion. So anytime you're very welcome to write in the chat box if you have something to add or to ask. And also I will pause from time to time so that we can really bring this to life and see how it applies to our own lives, to our own experiences, because that's where the Dhamma teachings truly come alive. And there's so many ways to interpret the sutta. Sometimes it's amazing when we unpack even a simple sentence, you know, there can be a lot more there than we may first uh, realize. So today, it is, uh, we're starting with the dangers in anger and the benefits of patience. And this is quite a nice teaching for me because I guess my main qualities could be said to be kindness and uh, compassion. I have quite a lot of empathy, but patience is not as developed as it might be. Sometimes I have that tendency to get a little bit impatient. Uh, and I think patience could be seen as a form of anger, actually. Might seem like a mild one, but it's still like, <laughs> hurry up. <laughs> right? Or being uh, a little bit less than forgiving with ourselves. So I shall begin. So this is called Five Dangers. And whenever the number five is used or the number 10 is used, you can usually find it in the Anguttara Fives or the Anguttara Tens yeah, um, of the Tipitaka, the Anguttara Nikaya. So I will use the word monastics here. Or well, actually, I'll use the word community because that's much more inclusive. Community. There are these five dangers in impatience. What five? One is dis displeasing and disagreeable to many people. One has an abundance of enmity. One has an abundance of faults. One dies confused. And with the breakup of the body after death, one is reborn in the plane of misery, in a bad destination, in the low world in hell. These are the five dangers of impatience. <laughs> so I just uh, <laughs> freaked myself out. Now. But of course, we're all pretty patient people, I think, those who are here. So um, I'll continue and then we can have some discussion. Community, there are these five benefits in patience. What five? One is pleasing and agreeable to many people. One does not have an abundance of enmity. One does not have an abundance of faults. One dies unconfused. And with the breakup of the body after death, one is reborn in a good destination, in a heavenly world. These are the five benefits in patience. So, as is often the case in the suttas, it's an opposite. Uh, analysis. And I think this is quite interesting because um, some of these are quite similar to attributes of a person with metta or a person without metta. Okay? The person with metta is also agreeable and pleasing to many people, but also to many beings, to the devas, to the animals as well, which is not mentioned here. One with metta also doesn't have an abundance of enmity, right? Because metta is the antidote to ill will. The part about confusion is also similar because with a lot of metta, we tend to die peacefully. We tend to sleep peacefully, wake up happily. And of course, if we have a mind of metta, just like a mind of patience, then uh, we generally will have a good destination, whether you believe in destinations after death, but even destinations in the next moment or the next day are likely to be good. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting to look at this from the perspective of patience and impatience. And uh, 
interesting too to see that the very first one is about how other people might perceive us one becomes displeasing and disagreeable to many people so how does it feel when others are impatient with us how do we perceive those people are we displeased do we find them disagreeable perhaps it makes us feel agitated right when someone's impatient and they're asking us to hurry up they're not giving us a chance to really express ourselves and to you know, get clear about what we want to convey, or maybe they're behind us, you know, as we're trying to, I don't know, put petrol in the car or take money out of a, uh, what do you call those things? I don't know, because I never use them. Cash machine? Is that right? <laughs> and somebody, you know, behind you is really irritated and impatient or behind you in the traffic. And that person agree appears displeasing and disagreeable. It perhaps could also imply that they become ugly. Mm -hmm. They become like they have an expression of, you know, irritation and uh, agitation on their face. So it's stressful, isn't it? When other people are impatient with us, it's quite stressful. And I think impatient people tend to, fit, tend to be a little bit rough mm -hmm. rather than gentle. Another um, way of understanding patience is gentleness. And uh, I often describe that aspect of right intention, the right intention that is non-cruelty, non-harm, gentleness, as related to patience, being patient with our experience, you know, not being too rough with it, not being demanding of our experience of, of our mind, but really being gentle, not kind of staring down too closely at the breath. Do you ever find that you're kind of just a bit too rough with the breath? You know, you have the object in mind and then you want to kind of grab it and hold tight to it, or maybe you get too close to it and the mind gets tense. So I think um, that can also stem from impatience, not being gentle, not, you know, allowing things to unfold in their own time, wanting our mind to stay with the breath right now. So um, there's a few reflections on, uh, on that one. And of course, the abundance of en enmity, we get irritated when we're impatient, right? And also when we get impatient, we are likely perhaps to do unskillful things. So we have an abundance of faults, not only the impatience, but many other faults as well, because we're really developing unskillful patterns in the mind. So, these are the five dangers of impatience. And then the opposites, of course. We've already said that they are a little bit similar to the advantages of metta. But also, I think, you know, in the practice, if we can have patience with our meditation, if we can give ourselves time to develop the mind, you know, so much time that you really don't push for things to happen. You understand that the practice is about putting causes in place and the results come in their own time. In my old um, practice with Goenka, who was my first teacher, he used to have this phrase, kalam agameya, which means let the time ripen, let the time ripen. And I found that so pleasing and such a relief, you know, to realize that, okay, just because I'm meditating now and I'm even committing my life to it or perhaps going on a really long course, it doesn't matter when enlightenment comes. It doesn't matter when the deep meditations come. Just let the time ripen and focus on putting the causes in place. So that gives spaciousness, doesn't it? Patience gives a sense of space. You know, you're allowing things to take their time. And there's some wisdom involved there because obviously things have to take their time. I mean, cause and effect is a natural process. It's not up to us. We can't control the outcome. We can only really control the way we relate. Even we can't control that as such, but we can influence it by a little bit of wisdom and by hearing the teachings and, you know, having good guidance on the path. So there's some of these benefits. And also with patience, I think we can be patient with other people, you know, like being patient in terms of allowing someone to express themselves, listening carefully, not rushing them. And uh, yeah, really leaning in to try to understand. So 
I think there's a, a wisdom in patience. And, it, you know, the Buddha speaks about patience as the highest austerity, the highest quality, if you like. I mean, austerity is a funny word, but I guess you could see it in terms of being a restraint, you know, that patience can put the brakes on so many unwholesome states and just give us a chance to pause. Right? Sometimes we just rush through life so fast. And, you know, we're just following our habitual tendencies to react without putting the brakes on at all. When we can just pause for a moment, you know, we have a choice. There's a choice as to which path to take in the mind or in our speech or, you know, in our bodily action. So um, someone has just joined from the future, <laughs> from New Zealand, so we'll let her in. And uh, it's tomorrow in New Zealand now. <laughs> So are there any questions or comments on this so far on patience? Has anybody um, had an experience of either feeling impatient or being treated with impatience? Or how do you relate to that quality? So I can see that Nikki also has a hand up, but she's not able to uh, raise it. Can we go to her first? Because I think uh, you haven't been here for a while. Nikki, could you unmute, please? On mute. There you go. Ah, oh, lovely. Ah, oh, nice to see you. Nice uh, to see you too. I've uh, been working, working, working. When you were talking about this, I kind of felt a little bit sad, really. Um, I don't, maybe it is anger, but if I think about myself, and particularly if I think about others I've worked with in my job, their impatience like a manifestation of fear. Yeah. More fear and trauma response, it'll come across like as ah, and it can look angry, you know, like that mm -hmm. raw of stay away or or the hurry up is is like this thing of it's not being able to contain what's inside. It's like a spill out of intense emotions. And mm. so it's this kind of this sounds really simplistic, doesn't it? <laughs> I know it's not, but it's kind of it's it's I wonder if, so it makes me ask, is like, because I work with so much trauma and that sort of thing, I always thought of, and I use, the, you know, the teachings in my work all the time. It's, it, mm. So I feel sadness and compassion for those that uh, are manifestate, you know, there's a manifestation of impatience. I know yeah. it's not nice to be on the receiving end of it, but I wonder what your thoughts are around about trauma response in mm. that sort of sense, really. Yeah. Well, first of all, I just want to um, echo what you said, because I thought there was so much wisdom in that, thinking of anger as sort of um, a spilling out, sorry, impatience, as not being able to contain what we feel, not being able to contain the emotions, or perhaps in that case, emotions triggered by trauma, and, um, and the fact that they then spill out. I think that's a really beautiful way to see it, because patience is something that keeps the mind inside, keeps the mind present with what's arising and is able to stay with it and give it time, you know, give it space. And I think in terms of trauma, sometimes it might be as though somebody has so much um, emotion, so much pain, so much shock inside their body and mind that, yeah, it actually in a sense has to come out. And it's more a case of rather than repressing it and always staying with it, which could be overwhelming for that person, how to start releasing it in um, bit by bit, how to let it out, you know, like say you've got a pressure cooker, you don't want the whole thing to suddenly, but you want like one of those lids on it, which just gives a little bit of the pressure out, you know, and then the lid goes down, and then the lid goes down. So I think these people probably, and everybody, these people, I mean, involves all of us, includes all of us, because we've all had traumas to a greater or lesser extent. I think we need a very safe place, you know, and people around that can really help us to hold those things and give us the space to process them gradually. So, of course, it's almost impossible. Some people are holding so much, so we can never judge. We can never judge. You know, how do we know how much sorrow or how much um, um, trauma? I mean, trauma can manifest as sorrow, depression, anxiety, um, shock. You know, all this, is, it stays inside the nervous system. It stays inside the body. 
Um, so I think a very, very gentle approach is needed. So maybe part of that patience is not always staying with, but being so gentle that you only stay for a short time, you know, and you're patient with your own process to the extent that you don't want to process everything at once. You know, you're happy just to stay with it for two minutes at some point in the day, just to stop and pause even for a few breaths. And that also can be the patience. Mm. Because perhaps for people with trauma, it's just too much to hold all at once. So, yeah, I mean, I, I really recommend with trauma that, you know, it would be useful for people to read books around it. For example, um, I can't remember the author's Bessel van der Kolk, is it? The, the Body Keeps the Score, this book. I haven't actually fully read it, but I did buy it a while ago. Um, I also have another really nice book that I... Um, had during my Rains retreat. It's, uh, I think it's called polyvagal theory, but it's exercises to regulate the nervous system. And that's really nice. Mm -hmm. So this can also be helpful because we can't always stay directly with the emotion, but sometimes we can learn to incline the mind to something that takes us out of the trauma we're feeling at that time. And that just gives the nervous system a break. Like they call it a ventral, uh, what do they call it? A what's the nervous system that's like limbic anyway they call it like a break um like putting on a pause and it can be things like they use the, I forget the author maybe I'll try to find it for the next session because it's a really great book it's practical and it's written by a, um, a psychologist who works specifically with regulating the nervous system of the clients because we're always affected at that level as well um and there's something called a glimmer, which is where you've only got like maybe 20 seconds. And you can just look for anything in the environment, like some flowers or like, I don't know, an empty space or like a tree or even a pet or something, anything that just takes you out of the pain you're feeling inside for a moment. And then over time that can develop into what they call a glow, which means you stay with that same thing for maybe a minute and you really soak it up. You really take in the beauty, you take in the kind of calming and soothing effect. So this is also one way to balance those difficult emotions by inclining the mind towards something that gives a little bit of relief. So I think patience would you know, involve also being very gentle um, with your process and um, patient enough not to judge yourself and not to compare yourself with others who may not have been through anything like what you've been through and the same when we meet others you know if we imagine that the people we've met may have been through horrific trauma I mean imagine if you knew they actually had then our relationship to them would change significantly we would be a lot more gentle and kind so we never know what someone else is dealing with I think that's really important to bear in mind yeah lovely thank you you're very welcome. James, could you unmute, please? Hello. Hi. I just wonder whether this week I had a sort of nice experience of learning to be a bit more patient with things. Um, I find like consistently every time I sit to meditate, I always get aches and pains in my shoulders. It's pretty much always there. And you know, I spend time sort of doing this, trying to sort of loosen it up a bit or just sort of sort of focusing on trying to relax it. And, and particularly the last few days have been particularly distracting. And uh, like yesterday, my morning sit didn't really go at all um, because of that. And I managed to do a little bit just before I went to work. And I just kind of thought like, um, rather than trying to sort of, I don't know, deal with it, get rid mm -hmm. of it, do something like that. I decided to just kind of like, just be patient and, you know, just to, to not try and escape it, but just sort of, <laughs> I don't know quite how to put it really. Um, just sort of be patient with it and sit with it yeah. and accept it yeah. and not think, ah, this, this, I, I can't sit if I have this ache in my shoulders. Yeah. I, can't sit if I have this swirling in my mind. Um, I can just, just sort of be with it yeah and and I found I'm, I managed kind of to find a sort of place of peace alongside that lovely yeah I mean it's it's a shame I, I, I had to go to work so 
I couldn't sort of stop to explore it more. And it was like, yeah, uh, yeah, I, yeah, obviously that's something I need to work on. But it was, it was, you know, one of those tiny little mm. limbs of, of like a good way to do things. Thank yeah, you. great, great. And that's what it is, isn't it? Like we just sometimes get in the groove and we realise, oh, somehow here I just managed to, you know, uh, tweak the relationship in a way that actually lessens suffering for myself. And it's not that it necessarily lessens the pain, the physical pain, but it lessens the resistance and the struggle with that pain. So I think what I picked up on was when you said the word acceptance. I think that um, acceptance is very close to patience, isn't it? Because it's not patience so that something changes. It's really genuine patience in the sense that you can sit with this indefinitely, mm. indefinitely. And it's great. You didn't even want to go to work. So you could have definitely continued to sit with that for a bit longer. So, yeah, very good. <laughs> Most days I don't want to go to work. I just want to sit with it. <laughs> yeah. Also, I mean, just to say that sometimes you are allowed to lie down if it's really intense, you know. Give yourself that opportunity too. It's not like we always have to go for, you know, the hard work. <laughs> That's the hard thing is, is people say about accepting acceptance, but you, you're kind of like, well, how do I do that? You know? Mm. Mm. It's just, you see, because these things are not concepts, they're experiences. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we sometimes don't, we can't really describe acceptance. It's something mm. that you only know when, you know, like you said, you mm. sort of somehow tweak it yeah just try things <laughs> keep, and keep learning keep experimenting yeah that's right trial and error yeah thank you you're welcome Geraldine could you unmute please thank you hi hi oops shoot I discovered my screen oh that's okay you won't be videoed okay no, I, I just did something weird with my computer. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, I'm, I'm new here, Kerdwin. Um, hi, Kerdwin. Hi, I'm in the US, uh, West Coast. Yes. So uh, I'm from the past. I'm You're from the past. <laughs> Basing it on UK standards, which is, of course, the center of the world. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I'm eight hours in the past. <laughs> so, um, so uh, this is a really good topic for me to start with because mm. um, I, I deal with impatience a lot. Um, and um, specifically, I, am, I have a chronic illness and I have um, caregivers that help me. Mm. And so I don't get to do my, my own shopping, for instance, or go do the errands or whatever. I have to send someone else. And I have one main person who does that for me and um, he doesn't choose the produce that I would have chosen. Yeah. You know, he gets things with cracks in them or whatever. <laughs> um, you know, he gets the wrong thing completely. Um, he, he just does everything wrong. Right. Oh, <laughs> you know, because yeah. I would have, I would have done it differently. Sure. And so and you don't have I, don't that control. Control. I don't have the control. And so, um, and I, I have been, I have been on five precepts for about 25 years. And so, um, you know, expressing anger or upset, um, I, I just try not to do that. He's doing his best, you know, he's doing his yeah. best. Yeah. Um, and so, um, and I noticed one day I was, um, in the car waiting for him to go get something and he can be really slow. And I got really impatient. And I thought he was still inside. And I, I sort of like said something like, how long does it take to, you know, I said it out loud and he was right there. Oh, <laughs> and, and I make a practice of like, not being angry with him, like in the moment, not expressing mm -hmm. anger to him, but I felt like that was a breaking of my precept about, you know, right speech. And, um, that it doesn't matter actually if I express it to him or if I'm just expressing it, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah, 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 and, yeah. And so the way, the way I've been dealing with it, and I wanna ask you if this is a good way to deal with it, is that when I'm feeling the impatience arise, I think of um, one that not getting what I want is a renunciation. 
Um, and that if I can see it as a renunciation, then it's like, well, this is a part of my practice. Mm -hmm. And also mm -hmm. that I see him as my teacher right now. Like he's my primary, one of my primary teachers because it's, I have anger and irritation arising a lot of the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, wonderful. I mean, it's interesting that you came to the point of reflecting on it as a renunciation because as soon as you said that someone else brings the food and you can't go shopping, I thought, yeah, I get that. <laughs> That's exactly the same for me. So exactly in the same way, you know, there might be things that I don't want to eat and there might be things that I wouldn't have chosen. In fact, there always will be because I don't choose them. <laughs> um, um, and so I really do understand the challenge involved and also the opportunity there for letting go. So that's great and really interesting to hear how, you know, you made that association between expressing that to yourself, but also seeing that it's not much different if you express it to someone else. Basically, it so happened he was there, but even if he wouldn't have been, it brought home that this isn't a really wholesome way to speak even inwardly. And, um, you know, I do that too. I, I say, oh, for goodness sake, how long does things take? And can't they hurry up? And, or can't the computer hurry up is usually the thing. And I feel that it doesn't matter too much because the computer's not a person, but it matters for the mind. So I don't know. I mean, you could see it as a breaking of sealer. I wouldn't probably see it quite that way, but I think, yeah, being patient with others and also being patient with ourselves when we have those faults, certainly. But there was another part of what you asked, and I now forget the second part. One was the renunciation and whether it's a good way to work with it. And you had another thing you were asking. Do you remember? I don't remember now. <laughs> <laughs> but it seemed to me like a good way to work and a good perception to have, because what it can do is give you motivation and um, align all these opportunities that you have in your life with the path. So, you know, it is much more challenging than, you know, anybody who's more able-bodied could um, imagine. And yet at some point, you know, many of us may be in a very similar situation. Um, eventually we all will be, and we haven't had the training that you've had. So this is really, you know, an opportunity to um, learn patience with the situation, patience with yourself. And of course, gratitude as well to those that are supporting you, which I'm sure you have a lot of. Yeah, it sounds like you're very sincere. So, yeah, but please do ask again if you remember what the other piece was. I, I remembered, I think it was the um, seeing him as my teacher. Yeah, 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 yeah. So perfect because that, you know, encapsulates gratitude, doesn't it? You know, our teachers are the people that we're most grateful toward. And uh, my own teacher, Adrian Brown, he came up with the same perception or a very similar perception when he was in Thailand getting bitten by you know, so many mosquitoes at once before the monastery, when the monasteries were still in the thick forest. And, you know, sometimes he exaggerates a little bit, but I think in this case, he was being honest when he said he counted something like 60 mosquitoes on his arm. And uh, I mean, he's always honest, right? But sometimes we can just elaborate. <laughs> but there was something like 60 mosquitoes and he learned to deal with that by seeing them as his teacher. And they taught him to really go deep inside the mind and find a place of acceptance, let's say, and equanimity. So it's great to see him as your teacher. And you know, we're all each other's teacher. Something one of my teachers once said in India, she was um, a Vipassana teacher. She said to me, because I was serving on a long course, 45 day retreat, and she said, you know, every student, each of them, they could be stream winners or they could be about to become stream winners. We don't know. So treat them as though they are. And I thought that was so beautiful. You know, there are also texts, aren't there, in different traditions about treating everybody as a, you know, as a, I don't know if as a God or as a Buddha, you know, because we all have that capacity, that potential inside. So imagine how life would change if we could really treat each other as noble beings with the same reverence that we'd treat a teacher, It'd be amazing. And also to treat ourselves in such a way. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I will now ask Victoria to unmute and I want to point to Soya's very- Yes, yes, yes. We'll come to that next. Hi. Um, hi Victoria. Hi. 
So one thing that was really striking was what you said about patients being the highest austerity to strive towards. And I think about, at least in the States, patients is, oh, wouldn't that be nice to have more patients? But when you think about, but we're so, you know, go, mm-hmm. go, go on to the next thing. Um, but when you think about how closely intertwined patients is with so many other things, with your safety, with um, your happiness, and also with learning. Um, yeah. you know, my son is 15 months. So I get a lesson in patience every day. <laughs> uh, and today uh, I was giving him his lunch and gravity is an, uh, a fun thing for him to be exploring with his lunch right now. And I thought, um, I, you know, maybe I'm supposed to be giving the, the look, the mom look, that stern, no, this is not what we do. And he kind of looked at me and, and first was like, I don't know what you're doing, mom. And then it upset him a little bit. And I was like, okay. And then I thought, well, if he was trying to learn, I wouldn't expect him to know his alphabet right now. Yeah. And if I was trying to teach him his alphabet right now, I wouldn't give him a stern look to learn that. So why would I be expecting him mm. to do this any differently? Mm. I'm the one who doesn't feel like going on the high chair, on the high chair, on the high chair, <laughs> <laughs> over and over. And I, it just made me think about all of those times when I've felt impatient with other people and maybe they just had something they were still trying to learn. Yeah. Or vice versa. I needed to learn something in that moment, but felt I wasn't able to grasp it and just needed to, to push through and, and forget it. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. I mean, it brings to mind just how much patience and, and the depth of patience that is possible to develop because it's so subtle. What you're talking about is so subtle. It's just a facial expression, just, and yet people pick that up. Children pick that up, you know, suddenly mommy's not looking like the same mommy anymore. And a really, really good um, analogy with, you know, patience and understanding that the two are so related. Because, you know, unless we can really uh, stay with something, stay with the situation long enough and really tune in to what the needs of the situation are, then we're not learning. We're just skipping from one thing to the next without any reflection. So it's beautiful that, you know, you're able to develop such gentleness with your child and also learn patience, allow him to teach you, him or her, I forget. Him. <laughs> yeah, I, thought, I think you said that, yeah. Um, to, yeah, to allow him to teach you and to give yourself time to learn because you're both learning together, right? He's learning how to be a baby and how to eat without the food getting <laughs> sucked down with gravity or whatever and you're learning how to be a mom so nobody has the answers straight away nobody ever will actually I mean, you can only ever do your best so yeah 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 but this idea of you know impatience that well just the whole speed of society and having to have things now and having to understand things now and having to have like all the answers like now it's just completely unrealistic and doesn't give us a time to grow and a time to learn the subtleties of life. So yeah, beautiful. Really lovely to hear. <laughs> so I'll come to the chat box now. And uh, so is saying, how does patience become automatic? And um, I guess the only simple answer is just the practice, 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 practice. Um, but whether it really ever becomes completely autom- automatic until we're enlightened, I'm not really sure. Because even at the third stage of enlightenment, when the view is perfect, even the first stage of enlightenment, the view is perfect. Um, you know, you understand that there's no one really in here, that everything's conditioned, that you understand about impermanence and suffering. Uh, you understand that it doesn't make sense to react with aversion. Still, even for a person who is uh, in the third stage of enlightenment, they still have some restlessness. They still have a little bit of agitation. So you could say that their patience is not perfected yet. 
but it's like with anything um it's just the practice you know and being patient with yourself in the practice because sometimes if we are looking to the goal of it becoming automatic or of it becoming like um so deeply ingrained in our character that we're always patient then we won't notice the patience that we already have you know it's important to notice the patience that is there don't only notice the impatience in the mind notice ways in which you are patient too you know and then that encourages the mind actually it's almost like what you notice is what grows because you start to see the mind starts to see ah this feels good this this is nice this is uplifting this is noble or ennobling and then the mind will want to go back to that place again and again just like james was saying with when he experienced a sense of acceptance the mind is eager now to you know to find that again and he may or may not but it doesn't matter at least you know what it is and the mind will naturally the mind has this innate intelligence i feel that it looks for a way out of suffering and it does incline um, in the right direction if we give it a chance and if we're patient with the mind. So I hope that helps. Don't expect too much of yourself because that also can turn into impatience. That's my thing. I'm a bit of a perfectionist. And so if I do something wrong or don't do it well enough, then, you know, I'm kind of on to myself. And that's not really very patient because that's discouraging to the mind. You know, we need to learn to encourage ourselves. Uh, just like you'd encourage someone at school. If you're a good teacher, you encourage the children and that's the way they develop and learn. So uh, James says, I've found with more meditation and practice, I've, become, I've naturally become more patient without explicitly having that intention. Yeah, because every time you practice, I mean, it's not an explicit intention, but you are training the mind to stay present. So Erlen says, I've been doing metta in the morning before work every day for two months. Yes. And it's been very beautiful for me, my family and co-workers. How wonderful. I'm much more patient when in metta mode for one. <laughs> I skipped meditation a couple of days ago and had a neutral day, which felt bad in comparison to the days with metta. Am I addicted to metta and its results? And is that a bad thing? No, no, you're just um, not addicted, but you're just noticing the effects of metta by noticing when it's not there. So that also can be an encouragement to you to practice and, uh, you know, to realize that most people feel less than neutral most of the time, right? So it's just like if you've eaten a meal, you feel full and then, you know, afterwards you go hungry. It's not that you're addicted to food. It's just that you haven't had your nourishment for the day. So you don't have to kind of think, well, I better not eat every day. You just keep eating every day and uh, enjoy your food, you know, and notice how it uplifts and makes you healthy and makes you feel nourished. So I think this is wonderful. So if you are addicted to meta and its results through direct experiential results, um, that's wonderful because it will encourage you to carry on. The only thing I would suggest is that if you're not able to do it every day and then you don't have such a good day, just notice it. It's just cause and effect. And don't beat yourself up about that. You know, it's not like now you have set yourself a new standard that you have to maintain at any cost, because that can be discouraging to the mind. You know, they say in psychology that um, if we have goals that are really difficult, we're much more likely to get us discouraged. So, for example, with exercise, we should make a small goal like let's move for five minutes, <laughs> you know, twice a day rather than let's go jogging for 40 minutes a day. So um, it's wonderful. Uh, it seems to me that if you are noticing the beneficial effects, that in itself will be enough of a motivation. And I've known meditators who actually, at some point in their practice, need to stop, need to stop meditating or choose to stop meditating or just their mind stops meditating for whatever reason. And um, part of them wants to kind of reteach themselves um, why they meditated, why they chose to meditate in the first place. So they get to the point where they really, really want to meditate again, not because they have to or they should, or they have, you know, something to keep up, but because they actually start to miss it. And then it re-inspires their reasons for practicing in the first place. So no, it's a very good thing. And I really praise the practice of metta. And metta will increase patience as well. They're very close. Yeah. 
if you're really, you know, feeling like you want the person's benefit and you're feeling a lot of warmth towards somebody, or at least may this person be well, may they be safe, then, you know, that's going to be maintained, even if they, you know, wind you up or test the limits of your patience, you know, that meta will kind of come out and you'll be just like, yes, but may they be happy and you'll be less likely to react in an impatient way. Uh, so Sarah says, the saying goes, every patience has a limit. But the famous Neapolitan actor Toto used to say, every limit has its own patience. <laughs> okay, I'll leave that one in the air. You can work that out and I'll try and do the same. <laughs> and Sybil says that meta is beautiful and is the right thing to do for you and the right thing to do for all of us. One reason you can tell meta is working is because you have less aversion. One way you can tell you have aversion is that, um, or that you have a tendency, which we all do, is that meta works <laughs> because it's overcoming something, right? I mean, if you sit down to practice meta and you suddenly feel a lot of happiness, then you know that there was aversion in the mind. So. Okay, uh, there's two more questions. So just these two for now, and then we'll um, move on. This is a little bit more to unpack on this subject. Lots more. So. Yeah, hello everybody. Hi, uh, Mira. Uh, it's, it's not a question, it's just a uh, thought that I had uh, with patience or impatience with setting goals. When you're setting a goal that's really outside of yourself, then you get impatient, uh, impatient about getting to this point. And um, um, just remembering um, a quote of Merce Cunningham, he's a choreographer from New York. And uh, I don't know if I cited really well, but he said there's two, two um, possibilities to move for a dancer. He can put a point outside of himself and go straight to this point, or he has a point inside of himself and moves this point forward. Hmm. It might be the same way of uh, move, but it's an, it has another quality. So this patience that you've got when you're inside of yourself is something different as as if you move and have a goal outside of yourself. And it's mm. the same for I'm a musician and I'm a teacher also. The most difficult thing for, for the students is to be patient. So mm. I have the monster, it's the snail. Please, please don't play faster than you can. And it's, it's always this, this most, most difficult thing mm. that, that you've got the patience to be slow. Right. Yeah, and, and it, this makes the things yeah. grow. You can force a tomato to be red. <laughs> and this is, this is very interesting also with the, with the um, subject of anger. Because you, you can't reach your goal as fast as you want, or mm -hmm. the, the society mm -hmm. wants you to be there. And, and then you get fear, and then you get angry. Yeah. It, it's, it's something that I, I really often recognize. This is just what I wanted to mm -hmm. share. Yeah. So interesting. Yeah. So interesting. And it sort of relates a little bit to what um, uh, Nikki said, because she was also saying about how impatience kind of spills out sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like, we can't contain our feelings. We can't contain our mind within. And it's a little bit similar, like the idea of, moving out to a goal or to a dance move mm -hmm. rather than staying with yourself and going with it mm -hmm. like you accompany that movement mm -hmm. it's much more integrated mm -hmm. you know it's much more present with yourself and respecting your own um yeah your own speed and your own um inner world not overstretching mm -hmm. but it's so hard isn't it in a society that you know wants it all now wants it all fast so i think your students are very lucky to have you to remind them this yeah. hope so hope so yeah for sure they, they're angry about it yeah well it's exposing the anger the anger comes up doesn't it when it yeah. comes up against you know uh things that slow us down <laughs> yeah they they have a certain conception also of how the music show shall be be played and it's come from from real great masters or from uh -huh. a cd and it, it takes time to, to go there. And this time, this is this lack of patience mm. that really makes it more difficult yeah. to, to get on, a, on, an, on another level. 
it's, it's really counterintuitive. I remember yeah, now a nice yeah. quote by Adrian Brown. He says, careful patience is the fastest way. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. I will use that. <laughs> careful patience is the fastest way because if you go too fast, it's not yeah. integrated. Yeah. It falls down quickly as well. You don't really learn things in a deep way. And it's the same with practice. It takes so long. You know, it takes many, many decades really of practice. So meditation practice before we can even begin to explain or to teach. So careful patience is the fastest way. Okay, the last question for now. I can't hear you, Gunter, but I think you're inviting Janaki to yeah. speak. <laughs> Janaki, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I used to become angry some years ago, I mean, for over for certain things, but I, I was able to control myself and um, uh, so controlling is ra rather, it, it is something like getting patience, but I don't think the pay, I mean, forgive me if I uh, say the wrong, wrong thing, but I would rather not look towards patience because meditation is a seasoning of the mind or exercising of the mind. So it gives a perfect control of your mind as you go on. So when you keep doing that, then, uh, then the, you will not be succumbed to these uh, emotions. So the, uh, because uh, you mustn't check the emotions or suppress the emotions or so slow down the emotions, but it may happen at the beginning. But if you go on meditating, uh, what happens is that you will not become a slave to your emotions. So it gives a, a, a perfect control of your mind uh, so then you will know uh, you, you will uh, you will know not to react but to respond yeah so that's how I have felt about it mm -hmm. I, yeah uh, it's right or wrong mm. yeah so I understand I think I understand <laughs> yeah you're asking me to comment Will you? yes please do. yes yes yes, please. yes. Yes, I think that's um, true. You know, I mean, we're not here in the practice to push away our emotions or to suppress them or to fight them or anything, but just to learn how to relate to them wisely and to give them the space they need to arise and then also watch them pass away. And I think the more we're able to do this, the less uh, perturbed we are by so-called afflictive emotions or emotions of impatience, because the mind that is watching those things is is you know, has all the time in the world. So it's the mind that's watching the emotions, the, the mindfulness, if you like, or the space between the knower and the known, a nice little uh, phrase also by Ajahn Brown, that space between the knower and the known is where the patience uh, can be developed, you know, in how we're relating to our experience. So even if we're angry, even if we're, you know, upset, we can be kind to the anger, we can be patient with the anger, and then over time, what happens tends to be that the content of the mind is not as strong or powerful as the mind itself. So the anger is still there, but the patience in the mind is so much stronger that that becomes eventually the object of the mind. Yeah. So then it doesn't too much matter what arises. <laughs> There's a certain equanimity. You could think of patience as equanimity or yeah, acceptance, spaciousness, all sorts of things. So yeah. Yeah, Certainly we're not. Uh, sorry, the mind precedes everything and controls everything. So it cannot, I mean, all the other physical uh, approaches that we undertake, but they won't, uh, I mean, uh, won't be the answer. So I think it is through the seasoning of the mind or the exercising of the mind, uh, that's the only way is meditation. So, so that you can get a perfect control of your mind. That's I think uh, how we how we have to go this journey. Uh, that's what uh, how I feel, of course, because I don't think that it, there is any power in this universe um, more uh, more stronger than the mind. Yeah, the mind. yeah, how, how yeah. It controls everything. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the way I understand that you're using the word control, because I mean, in my practice, I try not to control things in a way that's like manipulating them. But I think what you're saying is that the mind has the greatest effect. It has, it's the greatest, um, um, oh, what's the word? Um, predictor, if you like, of whether we're going to be happy or sad. It's not so much about what happens to us, although of course we want to avoid situations of intense pain and harm and abuse or anything like that. It's not that we should just stay there and say, okay, well, my mind's strong. So I'll just stay in this difficult situation. If you can move away, then good. But the mind is actually um, our greatest strength and our greatest power, especially when that mind is purified and full of beautiful qualities like loving kindness and compassion and patience as well. So yeah, that starts to direct our whole life. Thinking what I meant, sorry, the control, what I, I was thinking of was that control of one's own mind, not the others to control others, of course, control myself. Yeah, I know. I know. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So it's quarter past eight already. And that was just one small paragraph, which is wonderful, really, because as I say, there's so much to discover and so much to learn from each other as well with this. And um, there's one more paragraph that comes next, which is very similar to the last one. Um, it just has two different features from the others. So I'll read this out and we can uh, see if you can notice the two words that are different in this one. <clears throat> so community, there are these five dangers in impatience. What five? One is displeasing and disagreeable to many people. One is violent, one is remorseful, one dies confused, and with the breakup of the body after death, one is reborn in a plane of misery, in a bad destination, in the lower realm, or the lower world in hell. These are the five dangers in impatience. Community, there are these five benefits in patience. What five? One is pleasing and agreeable to many people. One is not violent. One is without remorse. One dies unconfused. And with the breakup of the body after death, one is reborn in a good destination in a heavenly world. These are the five benefits in patience. So another five. <laughs> you might want to make your own five later, different five. There's many benefits. But uh, it's interesting here that we come into the realm of sila in a sense the violence and the remorse, because remorse happens in one who breaks their precepts, right? In one who commits acts of body, speech, or mind, even violence towards one mind, one's mind, or um, we can sometimes be very violent with our mind, wanting to get rid of ourselves, you know, wanting to annihilate ourselves. This is very violent, um, even if we don't hopefully do this, <laughs> please don't do this. Um, we can have very violent thoughts. And then it does lead to remorse because afterwards we feel like, oh, this was cruel, this was unkind. And um, of course, if it actually does spill into actions of speech and body and we've harmed somebody, we're going to feel a lot of remorse. Sometimes people only feel it once they actually get the punishment sometimes. <laughs> and sometimes there are people who supposedly don't feel remorse, but um, I don't know if that's just really quashed down deep inside, you know, really due to trauma or I don't know, due to so many repressed emotions. So I think this is also like one of the aspects of impatience, which is that impulsivity, you know, that um, quick reaction based on anger without pausing to reflect before we act um, and letting that impulse overtake the mind, overwhelm the mind, yeah. And when we practice patience, when we practice meditation, of course, we're much more likely to uh, see these things arising before they get too extreme. So the violence and the remorse also indicates how unethical and how unvirtuous impatience can become. So are there any questions or comments around that? Because it's almost, it's 20 past eight and I'm not sure 
I don't think we have time to go into the next bit, but it would be really nice to hear anything more, maybe something around how you work with uh, feelings of impatience in the mind or um, how does it feel to be impatient? What do you notice in your body, in your mind? I'm asking you the question before I go to more questions from you. <laughs> do you notice anything happening? Do you notice, I don't know, a tendency to break into violence at all? How does that manifest? You don't have to answer, but I'll give you a moment. Gunther, would you like to unmute Leah? Hi, Venerable. Thank you. Hi, Leah. Hi. Um, I used to be really impatient. I mean, you know, really impatient. Uh, since I was, you know, really like going to a real tantrum. I remember when I was younger, God. And um, I got to a point when I realized that actually somebody helped me, some, a boyfriend, he sort of introduced me to the journey, the inner journey. And I've noticed, you know, I've, I've been doing meditation now for I don't know, 12, 14 years. And I'm, I feel it, it has changed me, you know, this is like, my family comment on it, you know, mm. and um, but sometimes I do, you know, like there are moments in which, you know, the monster <laughs> raises it and it's really upsetting. It really is so upset. In fact, you know, it's happened quite recently and I'm still struggling to, uh, you know, it's really difficult, you know, uh, because you want to give space to what's, what's coming up, you know, and um and why you lost your patience and sometimes you just have to allow for that to happen but it's very difficult because you know there's guilt there's all but, but i i would say that well and, and when that happens it's like really ugly because it's your whole body that is like uh it's angry it's not just you because i because i notice a lot in my body you know because if you do a meditation you know you know your body a lot more and you and I can feel it in my body, like the agitation of it, you know, and yeah. it's not nice at all. And uh, it's just so much nicer to to be in that space, you know, when you when you just stop yourself and you think, okay, it's okay, you know, you don't have to be angry about it. And you feel and you feel, yeah, you feel like more relaxed and more and safer as well. Somebody talked about safety, that was really and yeah. it's quite it's it's quite urgent that we do this you know because because we you know as when we were reading the paragraph about dying and it's so important you know and everything and every time it happens i just i just think oh my god look at this misery <laughs> look at this misery is coming up again mm. it's quite upsetting and it's then it's an opportunity to open your heart even more but it's so humbling you know uh, that we are swept away by these winds like you know and all the work seems to have gone just like that <laughs> but it's not it's not like that but it's if we pay attention it's mm. goodness me it's like so humbling isn't it mm. that's a really interesting point about how it can feel that it sweeps away all the other good stuff because i guess in that sense the patience is sort of almost like the glue that holds the qualities together mm. holds all our good qualities and gives them the chance to you know, grow. Maybe that's one of the reasons the Buddha says it's the highest austerity, it's the highest quality, you know, because it's sort of the container for everything else. But of course, you know, things haven't actually disappeared just because you experience impatience. And I think, you know, it's a hard thing to practice in a very impatient world. Mm. It? I mean, the conditioning is very deep. Um, I mean, perhaps there can be some virtue in a sort of I mean not in impatience that harms ourselves or others but I mean I know the part about sort of tantrums and stuff like when I was young I was also pretty impatient you know I wanted things now and I didn't have a lot of uh, time to wait and in a way that can also translate into being quite a passionate person and if that passion's directed in a positive way like you know 
in the sense wow. that you are sort of really dedicated and focused on your goal, then it can be a sort of driving force. It's okay. just that it won't be enough because the practice takes time and the practice, you know, you can direct your mind to something and feel like, yes, this is what I want. And, you know, I don't have many lives to do this. You know, you know, like a sense of urgency is something that the Buddha praises, a sense of urgency. And I think that's what you're talking about, too. You know, seeing that you suffer when you're impatient and wanting to, you know, stop engaging with these unwholesome states. You know, there's a sense of urgency. I don't want to die impatient you know I don't want uh, these unwholesome states to cloud the mind and that's fine as so long as we can give ourselves time to regroup mm, yeah, and yeah. to start practicing again so it could be also that the metta practice is a good bridge you know you've been impatient you feel terrible about it you feel rubbish the body feels tense and sort of stressed and contracted then practice a bit of self meta you know meta for yourself to soften things a little bit and to open that spaciousness yeah that's that's good that's a good um, good advice and mm -hmm. I, I wrote down let the time ripen i'm going to great yeah yeah it's nice isn't it let the time yeah. ripen yeah that's one that i should probably have on my wall <laughs> I, I like i like uh, that let go you've written uh, behind <laughs> very beautiful book, calligraphy it's very beautiful yeah that's not my calligraphy, but yes, it's a nice little sign. Yeah. <laughs> I, you're very welcome. There's a couple of things in the box and I'm not sure I have time to actually answer any questions, but I just want to read out the comments that are there uh, before we close, just to uh, share the wisdom of the group. So uh, Sarah's saying, impatience gets me restless. Yeah, yeah. And so it says, it seems like when I'm very impatient, the mind becomes like a prison. Yeah, yeah. And then violence or intense anger comes from a lot of fear of being trapped in the reality that my mind has made. Mm, yeah, we get angry with the impatience. We get violent towards the impatience itself. Yeah. So can we soften towards that patience and allow it impatience and actually... Be, be patient with the impatience. It's not easy. The whole body is kind of on speed. And Rasa says, I think a way to practice patience is to practice curiosity, allowing to not know why things are happening as they are. And being curious why. Mm. Yeah, allowing ourselves not to have all the answers straight away, yes. And just be open with an investigative mind that wants to understand. I think that's great. Because when I am impatient, I seem to know why things are happening as they are. <laughs> yeah. But perhaps I don't know. Give it a benefit of the doubt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is my impatience too. Like I want to know. I want to know why things are happening. <laughs> we want to have it all packed, all sorted out. And perhaps we don't know. Perhaps when we think we know, that's only one part of the truth. And there are many other reasons or many other aspects yet to discover. So, yes, this also relates to humility, doesn't it? Yeah. And to, you know, not feeling that we have to be so much in control. This feeling of needing to know, needing to be in control, it's also a safety mechanism. You know, we need to feel like we understand our environment, we understand this world. And it's a kind of... A, a, needing to know it's a kind of control it's a kind of control so Janike says when you're impatient you're restless your physical activities are disturbed you can't make a sound or a harmonious decision yeah the decisions you make could be wrong yes one advice I've had from Ajahn is well maybe I made it up myself actually can't credit him with everything <laughs> is um Whenever there's doubt, it's not the right time to de make decisions. And the danger is, isn't it, that, you know, we want to rush the decisions. We get impatient and just make impulsive decisions. Patience, on the other hand, looks like a temporary technique, like the brake system of a car. Can be temporary. Good for the moment, but it does not bring a lasting effect. Oh, I think it could. I think it's about joining the moments of patience together. 
and making it more as a sort of, a, I think it's related a little bit to calm, you know, to being slower with life, to being more laid back. But through meditation, one can get the control of mind and make a long lasting peace and harmonious decisions. Thinking mind overrides the emotional mind. The quality one gets when one practices meditation. Yeah, you know, meditation is different things for different people, but I think in the end, whether you're focusing on patience or metta or whichever quality, all of them are, are actually developing in the background. They're all arising, they're all developing and coming to fulfillment. <laughs> this is nice from Nikki. If in doubt, do now. <laughs> Nout, it's like an English accent. <laughs> do nothing. If in doubt, do nout. <laughs> Very nice. So I'm going to hand over to Kelly to say a few words to end the session. And after that, I will let you know about next week what's happening. So. Great. Thank you, Venerable Chanda, for so generously offering us the opportunity to read and discuss the suttas together. It's really great to be here together with everyone this evening. Um, as always, this evening's sutta discussion is offered on a donation basis. And if you would like to offer Dana uh, any contribution you would like to make uh, to provide for Venerable Chanda's material needs and to support the development of the first Bikuni Monastery in the UK, that would be very much appreciated. I have put the link uh, to the Anacampa website uh, in the chat box uh, so you can find out more information uh, about the project and how to donate. Thank you very much. And warm thanks to Kelly and to Gunther and to Matthias who are working hard behind the scenes to make sure these sessions are very well organized and safe and uh, and that we have, you know, these recordings to go back to, because I think it's not only what I'm sharing, it's what everybody here is sharing. And it's so rich to hear all these different perspectives. I really enjoy learning from all of you and, you know, just seeing different ways to look at these incredibly deep and profound qualities uh, that we are developing in our minds. Huh? So thank you also for your lovely questions and comments. I think uh, it's just a testament to your love of the Dhamma if you are experiencing benefit from this. So that makes me very happy, of course. And uh, next week, <laughs> oh, I think tomorrow, apparently there's a meta session, which I forgot about. But anyway, my co-hosts reminded me. So this is why they're so great, because I was going out, actually. <laughs> But it's okay. I wasn't going out till about 10. So tomorrow morning, there's a meta session. I hope I remember. Maybe one of the co-hosts can actually send me an email because it wasn't in my mind. I'm sure I'll remember now, but just drop me a line. So meta from 9 to 10 tomorrow. And of course, that will feed into your practice of patience. And, uh, and then next week, we have the retreat, the online seven-day retreat with Ajahn Brahm, with myself assisting and so there'll be nothing happening during the week except for that retreat. So there'll be no chanting on Wednesday and no Sutta class on Friday next week. But there will be all of those things the following week. Okay, so tomorrow, metta, and that will have to last you through the week. Then I'll see you next time for the chanting, unless you're joining in this retreat. There are still a few places left, but we are asking full-time attendance. If you would like to join, but you can't come all the time, then we are uploading the videos pretty quickly after they happen. And we're streaming the first and last session of the day every day on our Facebook page. So that's Anu Kampa Bikuni Project Facebook page. Ajahn Brown's morning talk and guided meditation at 8.30 a.m. until 10. And my evening session from 7.30 till 9 p.m. will be streamed live, yeah? So the theme is on emboldening the mind with sparkle and fizz or fizz and sparkle. That was Ajahn's idea combined with an idea from someone else. He just wanted to call it fizz and sparkle, but someone else wanted courage. So we just added it, <laughs> added it up and came out with that. And uh, my evening talks are going to be on sila, first of all, but then the five indriyas, the five uh, powers of the mind, the five spiritual faculties. Um, and those five spiritual faculties are confidence or trust, faith, um, energy, energy in the mind, um, mindfulness, 
stillness, samadhi, and wisdom. So that's what you'll be getting. So that's every day, actually, next week. Okay. For those who are on Facebook, otherwise, you'll be getting the videos on our YouTube channel. Okay. Very good. Nice to see the Lithuanians connecting there. And, uh, and nice to be with all of you. So take care and let's unmute you so that we can make a lot of noise as we say goodbye. <laughs>